All right, thank you everybody for joining us today. We have a special webinar series on dam safety today. We're going to be discussing reducing risk with real-time monitoring and the best practices around that. Before we get started and introduce our speakers today, uh, just to note, everyone is muted by default. We're going to be uh, recording this webinar, so if you would like to reference anything in the future or share with somebody uh, that was unable to attend, uh, we will have a, uh, we are planning to have a recording made available at the end of this. So if you would, uh, uh, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, you have a couple ways to ask it. Uh, the easiest way is to ask it through the questions tab. So you can enter your question there. We have a couple people monitoring that. We will try to work that in throughout the presentation. And uh, if at the very end, we will open up the floor. If you would like to unmute yourself at the very end of the presentation, we will make that available and you can ask your question uh, directly to our staff and put us all on the spot and hopefully we can try to answer that. Yeah, if after the presentation you have any other questions or would like to get more information about anything you've seen today, uh, feel free to reach out to us, information at onerain.com or our phone numbers are listed there. And with that, we will introduce our speakers today. First up, we have Scott Bores. He is the uh, manager of field engineering for One Rain and High Sierra. He has been uh, at One Rain for 11 years now and has been leading the project management and installation um, and upgrades of systems across the country, ranging from dam safety systems and early warning systems all the way to flood warning uh, systems nationwide. We also have Tom Ogden will be one of our speakers today focusing on uh, levee erosion in this presentation. Uh, Tom has been uh, at High Sierra for 27 years now and he's been in the hydrology space and involved with flood warning systems and early warning systems since 1980. So Tom brings a, a wealth of information to this presentation and we're excited to, to have him on. And then finally, I will be presenting. My name is Charles Jose. I'm the product manager uh, for OneRain where I cover the, uh, the software our suite of products called Contrail. Uh, I've been involved with OneRain since 2013, and I've been in the uh, rainfall and flood warning space uh, since 2010. So uh, about 10 years now I've been in this industry and helping out. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, just a, a really quick, um, uh, very simple agenda here. Basically, we're going to give some background information about dam safety and, and reducing risk, uh, as well as uh, go through some challenges and best practices to focus on. Uh, we have a, uh, a usage case that we'll be uh, working through and, and showing uh, the system kind of in action. At the very end, we'll, we'll have a summary here. So a little background uh, about dams, and I may or may not be preaching to the choir for this, uh, but before we uh, really start to provide and talk about some challenges and some bad things about dams, uh, we want to just talk about, you know, there are significant advantages for society uh, for implementing and, and using dams. Yes, there's some environmental impacts, um, but in general, uh, the reason there's been a, a, a flood of dams since the since the 50s is uh, they, they really provide some really significant advantages um, that, that we can use to leverage. So things like water supply, having a consistent source of water supply uh, for populations or providing water supply to areas that do not have any sort of uh, water. Um, flood control, being able to mitigate uh, the amount of flooding, uh, as well as provide hydropower and irrigation uh, water resources. And you know, at the very end of the list, it's, it's great to be able to, to use uh, some of the benefits that, that dams provide. However, with these advantages um, that I just listed, there are some um, disadvantages and things to really think about. I mentioned the environmental side, uh, but what we're really gonna be focusing on today is that risk. And dams just by their very nature are inherently risky, right? Um, by design and what they're designed to do, 
to uh, hold back massive amounts of water and pressure, um, they're going to be risky. And, um, and really when we think about risk, there's a lot of ways that can increase that risk that's already naturally uh, um, built in with dams. And uh, that could range from faulty design from maybe initial design work, including construction, all the way to advancing age that might, uh, if, if things aren't maintained, or deterioration that, that happens uh, without any sort of rehabilitation. And then primarily, primarily this last item we're going to be really talking a lot about. It's that growth upstream and downstream of population that are going to be um, going to be increasing our risk, right? What's what's the the ultimate either uh, partial or complete failure of a dam uh, puts that those populations downstream at substantial risk, and and even sometimes operating within the the normal operating range can provide some risk for for people downstream. And so with that, there's a uh, agreed upon classification to help us understand what the the risk is associated with these dams. So it's a, a generally agreed upon across the North America here uh, called the hazard classifications. And it ranges from low hazard where there's uh, no probable loss of life, there's any sort of failure or misoperation of the dam, um, all the way up from significant hazard to high hazard. And high hazard it means that if there's any sort of failure or issue or misoperation with the dam, it will probably cause loss of life, right? And, uh, we rarely see that word probably, uh, especially on the engineering side. Um, so this is a very high hazard subset of dams um, that if there's any sort of issue around these dams, we're gonna have um, very likely that we're gonna have loss of life or at least economic impact or loss. So this high hazard is where we spend, when we think about dam safety, this is where we spend most of our time uh, unfortunately, this, uh, this category is increasing, um, and that's called hazard creep, that basically our percentage of dams, total dams, that are in the high hazard classification is increasing every single year, and it has been. This chart on the right shows um, the significant hazard dams, that inventory, um, large percentages of these dams are slowly being reclassified as high hazard. And that's primarily due to what's called hazard creep. Basically, things happening downstream or at the dam can slowly increase its, its hazard rating and, and move up throughout the classification. And when we think about these total numbers of high hazard dams, uh, we're talking about over 15,000 here in the US alone. Uh, so a large number of dams that if they are misoperated or have any sort of issue with them, there will be loss of life downstream, just to kind of reemphasize that. And of those 15,000, over 2,000 of those are deficient in maintenance or rehabilitation work and are, are listed as uh, critical within that, that high hazard dam category. And, and, I, and I threw in this last number here that, that almost two thirds of dams are privately owned. Now these, these range in size and uh, can certainly impact the number of dams that are um, that are within these classification, uh, all these classifications. Um, but but it's important to note that a lot of times property owners may not even know that they have a uh, a dam on their property. I just might be um, a a detention pond or basin, uh, maybe just a little earthen dam. And this is important because when we talk about the risks associated with these dams, um, these privately owned dams certainly don't have um, a mechanism or path to to help uh, either maintain or rehabilitate these dams to to help try to reduce that risk as much as possible. And so this presents a a really clear problem that we have and a, a really challenge. Right, we have a lot of these high hazard dams that have uh, really inherent risk with them, um, and it has increased risk because of the classification. And so we, we, we're kind of in this, uh, this uh, problem area where um, oftentimes dams are either too expensive or too costly to fix um, or to maintain or, or rehabilitate outside of um, uh, 
um, having having issues. But we also have downstream dams uh, or downstream communities that may not be able to to move or mitigate their risk, um, as well as uh, continued community de development um, and and enhancing that that hazard creep that I was just mentioning. So we have this this real problem, right? Dams are are naturally risky because of issues that we have with um, with downstream development and not being able to to move communities or to to mitigate or rehabilitate dams. Um, this problem is continually to grow and and to be a, a real um, a real challenge for communities. So the the one way that uh, we've we've had a lot of success with, especially in the in the dam safety industry, is by adding in real time monitoring. So real-time monitoring can help reduce that risk that we were talking about, especially for downstream communities. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about real-time monitoring and early warning systems, um, primarily because they can help understand what those conditions are, what's happening upstream of the dam, uh, what's going on at the dam, as well as downstream of the dam, uh, so they can uh, to provide a, a cost-effective solution to to lower that risk now when when we mentioned real-time monitoring and early warning systems um, here's here's a picture on the right of a particular station uh, here in Colorado located uh, at an earthen dam here on the front range and these uh, systems uh, can help the lower risk for uh, exactly what I mentioned if we're not able to to lower the risk at the dams or mitigate any risk downstream at communities. And we can use that data to understand what's the health of the dam, what's going on at the dam, uh, as well as, hey, what are the conditions, what is going to be impacting me in the, in the near term uh, with inflow into my, my reservoir or, or, uh, or body of water here. And we can provide uh, and, and receive valuable information, right, so data points, real world data points to make these critical decisions and, and to verify conditions. Right? And we can use that data to then drive our emergency action plan. And ultimately with the, the kind of the end goal is to provide lead time and uh, information and notification to, to, uh, to mitigate that risk for downstream communities. Now, uh, the, the one big challenge that we're going to be facing here, and we're going to be talking and spending a lot of time on this, is, uh, is every dam is unique in, in how we design and implement monitoring requirements. There's a saying in the, in the airline industry, if you've seen one airport, you've seen one airport. Every dam, based on uh, the decade it was built, the uh, geographic and top, uh, the, the environmental features, uh, has been designed um, to meet that specific location. And um, all of the challenges, including size of watershed, whether it's flashy, whether it's dry year-round, whether there's hydropower located, um, every dam has uh, really an infinite number of complexities and challenges that, that make that specific dam unique. So uh, that's what we're going to be focusing on. We're going to be talking about um, best practices because we're not able to say hey here's here's one one solution and it'll work in every place right we have to uh, we're going to be presenting these best practices things we've learned over the years uh, we've we've been doing this as a company for uh, for about 20 years now um, providing these these dam safety solutions in uh, real-time monitoring so with that I'm going to be passing it to Scott uh, Scott can unmute himself and he will be talking and walking through some of the best practices for um, for real-time monitoring and early warning systems. Scott, take it away. Hey, thank you, Charles. All right, so I want to start with kind of what the approach is for determining locations and the data collection to get the information that you need to make your critical decisions. Obviously, we need to start with talking about locations. You need a location at the dam for monitoring uh, reservoir elevation downstream for any seepage or outflow, but also possibility of upstream, you know, do you have flow coming in or are there additional rain gauges up in the basin, you know, if uh, rainfall heavily in fact affects your um, operations. 
added that with the ability of cameras. Cameras are become widely available. We can work them off the grid and remote with solar panels. So giving that visual confirmation as well to see not only what the data is showing, but the visual confirmation of what's going on on site. Being able to look at the spillway, the dam, the equipment, the upstream, you know, the weather conditions. With those locations, any supplemental data that may be available, right? If you have a large watershed or an upper basin, you know, can we leverage gauge adjusted radar rainfall, right? Can we ground truth the radar to give a better, more accurate idea of how much rainfall is falling in your watershed? Uh, couple that with basin averaging alarm and when a certain amount of average rainfall um, falls within your watershed or basin. Or are there other public data points out there, the USGS, CADS, METAR, any other data points that we can bring in to get a better idea to help you make the decisions on how to operate in an emergency situation. All this data collection resides with your EAP, your emergency action plan, right? The data is going to tell you a story, but if your story, you know, doesn't have an action point, a plan, that when this elevation is met, we need to, you know, call these certain individuals, we need to evacuate, we need to open this gate, right? The EAP is the most critical part of taking all of this information together and having an action plan on how to deal with these situations. So continuing on gauging locations, um, you know, we talked about the dam and the downstream. And the most simple and easy deploy is your dam and downstream. Again, you know, if we have other upstream locations, cameras, and additional gauges, maybe just rain gauges up in your upper watershed, um, I'll give you a better picture of what is happening on site while you are in maybe an event criteria. So some of the things that we want to monitor, um, you know, if we're looking at monitoring criteria at a dam, right, it can be very simplistic, of the basics that we need of just reservoir elevation. Um, and then we always like to have redundant sensors with this, right? We are talking about mission critical operations here. So at the dam, we typically have a pressure transducer or something to measure the stage or reservoir elevation, but then a redundant sensor to go with that, maybe another pressure transducer, um, float switches, little liquid level switches that I'll show in uh, a later example to give confirmation um, of these elevations. Rainfall is huge. Um, but then also other sensors. You may have other meteorological sensors that you're interested in, such as, you know, relative humidity, air temperature, barometric pressure. Wind is huge if you have dam loading with high winds. Um, but all to go with this is you have your sensors that you're reading at the site, but it's really important to also understand this, your system health, your battery voltages, maybe your max, your min, your average, um, bite count, any type of system health so we understand you know, if there's an error or a warning or anything that may be misinterpreted with the data, um, we want to be able to get that data in real time as well. Your downstream location, right, it's very critical that the downstream location catches the entire um, outflow of the dam. Um, that says, you know, you, if you have a spillway, an emergency spillway, and maybe some seepage wells, Right? If there's any type of failure, seepage, outflow from your spillways, we want to make sure that that downstream location collects it all. In some cases, this may be a mile downstream. Uh, most cases, you know, it's pretty close to the uh, your major earthen dam or concrete dam face. Um, but the critical thing is making sure that you're going to catch uh, that additional um, outflow or water that comes from it. Um, also, the downstream location, a lot of dams have seepage wells, V-notch weirs. You know, it may be beneficial to put sensors in those locations um, so you can get a better idea of actually what is um, coming out. You know, we can then calculate flow on these V-notch weirs and on the seepage. So looking at a dam location, um, this is kind of, um, I'll say, Typical, you know, like Charles said, you know, the, we build these systems dependent on the criteria and the environment of the dam. Uh, this, for instance, is an earthen dam. On the right side of this picture here, we kind of have the infrastructure. Um, starting at the top of that, we have our tipping bucket rain gauge to collect rainfall and most importantly, rainfall intensities um, of current weather conditions. We have our telemetry, um, you know, if that's via RF, via uh, radio frequencies, antenna, or satellite, right, satellite communications. Moving down the mast, any type of 
additional meteorological sensors. In this case, we have a relative humidity and air temperature sensor. And then we kind of have you know, the brains, you know, where our data logger and our components that control the satellites and read and store the data is located. Um, going down from that, you know, we have this. Uh, hey, Scott, you know, sorry to interrupt, but uh, we're, we're getting some, some background audio. If you're on a phone, can you uh, please mute? I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody, and Scott, I'll probably have to unmute you. Okay, Scott, Thanks, are you there? Yep. yep, thank you. Um, so continue on, right? We have our pressure transducer, our stage sensor in the reservoir elevation. Um, you see these float switches, and there are two arrows that are depicted. You can, I'll show a better picture of the floats here shortly. But all these are that liquid level switch, and that low float corresponds to that emergency spillway you see in the background. So when the water hits that emergency spillway, it's going to hit that float, and it gets us that redundant confirmation that the water is at the spillway. Your higher float is probably located at, you know, a specific EAP level or an emergency action plan level where, hey, once we've reached this elevation, now we need to evacuate or um, notify certain personnel on what our criteria is. One other thing to mention is uh, other sensors, you know. Not only, you know, other people may be looking at your data, we're seeing an increase of people wanting to know about water quality, water temperature, and how that may affect other operations at the dam. So it's easy to add these additional sensors, you know, as pH, um, dissolved oxygen, you know, turbidity, anything that may go, especially if it's a hydro dam or, you know, recreational, anything of that nature that may affect how other operations of the dam operate. Uh, bringing in those additional sensors is something easily accomplished once you have an established early warning system. The downstream, the downstream looks a lot like, um, you know, your dam site. In this case, we have our, um, you know, our own infrastructure in place in this picture. But just keep in mind, even at the dam, like if you have a gatehouse or, you know, maybe a concrete embankment, no matter what it is, I mean, these systems can be tailored to be pretty low profile or mounted inside. Um, existing infrastructure, or in most cases, or in some cases, if you have an earthen dam, right, adding your own infrastructure to be independent. Um, for this downstream location, right, we are below uh, the dam and the spillways, and we want to make sure that our pressure transducer is in, at the deepest part of the channel, right? If there's any type of seepage or the spillways or maybe even your gates are operated, we want to be able to collect that flow or that reading uh, from your downstream location. And based off that stage, right, we can add rating tables or anything of that nature to calculate flow. In this instance, we have two float switches. Again, placed at critical elevations. We see that that high float is right at the bottom of the bridge embankment. So we know if that high float is triggered that, you know, the water has reached the correct or the bottom elevation of the bridge. All right, uh, the float switches here on the right. Oops, sorry, Chuck. Um, those are just two examples of a liquid level switch, um, right? Very simple. They're, they're a cost-effective solution in, uh, instead of a pressure transducer. Um, easily replaceable. They stand up to a, a lot of beating, uh, but very basic and simplistic in design. Um, and it gives you a ability to add, you know, critical points along the way. Um, what we do like with, we add some smarts to them. We call them end-of-line resistors. Think of it as, you know, like a top-notch security system. Right, we have resistors so we can understand the voltage inside the flow switch. So if you know the cable were to get cut or a mouse chews through the wire, you know we get that notification that the flow switch is damaged and it won't trigger during an event, rather than it not being an operational event. So anytime we design a system, you know we really want to be conscious of this is mission critical. Right, what can go wrong? How do we mitigate failure? Or if something does happen environmentally, you know, a solar panel gets damaged, a mouse chews through a wire, someone trenches and cuts your wire, right, that we get notified about it and you're aware of it so you, you can resolve the situation rather than it going unnoticed until you're in an event. Continuing on, um, equipment considerations. There we go. Um, right, we want to be conscientious of the environment that these systems are deployed in. Power is huge, right? Most times we want to be on our own independent power source. Uh, these systems are very low powered and thus, you know, can run on a simple 10 watt solar panel. Um, however, typically we'll deploy with 
backup or larger panels. So if someone throws a rock or something of that nature and destroys half the panel, we still have a usable source of energy and power um, to charge the system. Battery backup, right? If a panel were to fail or get destroyed or stolen, you know, having that battery backup where the system can run autonomously for three to four months until someone can get out there to repair that solar panel. So these are all things we want to consider. Depending on the location, you know, it may be, you know, this site may not be accessible in the winter or something of that nature, and you need it to be operated or in peak operation during spring runoff. So having that battery backup or considering um, those scenarios is key when you want to deploy these things. Even if there's AC power, right, we see breakers trip a lot on some remote dams where the power is not reliable. So even with that AC power source, we want to make sure that we have the battery backup um, if there were to be a failure. Redundancy, right, I kind of talked about stage. You know, we typically don't want just a single uh, stage sensor, you know, having, you know, another source of, you know, a radar, a bubbler, a float switch, right? We want that two kind of step verification. In that case, if a sensor were to fail, you still have that backup, or if both sensors are operational, you have that verification that what you're reading is real. Rainfall, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but, you know, if you have a watershed, you know, a large watershed that all contributes into your reservoir and is highly affected um, by rainfall in the upper basin, you know, adding additional rain-only gauges to understand, you know, we have an intense rainfall, you know, we, we got a half of inch in 15 minutes, you know, what does that correlate to what's going to be coming down uh, into your into your basin, into your watershed, um, you know, and then that way we can alarm early on that criteria uh, before that water actually hits, uh, you know, your reservoir. And that goes upstream, right, if you have tributaries flowing in, putting additional gauges maybe to calculate the inflow, again, adding rating tables or anything of that nature, you know, just by the stage, you know, we have the ability to calculate, you know, what that flow comes into your, your reservoir. Other data sources, we mentioned on that, but right, what, what else is out there to help us make these critical decisions? You know, if there's public data out there, you know, let's bring it in, let's, let's ingest that data, let's use it um, and help understand it for your, you know, day-to-day -day operations, or mission critical activities. Uh, vandalism environment, I mean, that's kind of the biggest thing anytime you deploy one of these systems. Um, depending on your environment, if you're very far north or at high elevation, right, what kind of snow do we get? Is it accessible? You know, do we need to build the system to be able to withstand that environment? Are you in the desert? You know, what kind of bugs and insects may be able to, you know, get into your sensors? And do we need to use a different sensor because, you know, we have a more resilient design that works with that environment um, scenario. Uh, vandalism is always kind of the number one thing depending on the location. Um, how do we need to harden the system to uh, reduce vandalism? You know, if you're at gatehouses, you know, depending on the location, kids love to climb on gatehouses and jump off into the water, right? How do we secure our instruments, protect our instruments so that they're always operational in mission critical times? Telemetry. Telemetry, right, this is, this is the big thing. How do we, we want to get the data in real time, right, and what telemetry is best for you. These, these stations, these early warning systems need to be mission critical, right. When you're in an event, it needs to be working. If, you know, we can look at, you know, Hurricane Katrina or any other past events when, um, if, every, if you're in an event and everyone's on their cell phone calling for help, cell phones go down, right. The network gets inundated, you can't make a call. Well, that goes the same thing if you have maybe a cell modem at your site, right? If you're in an event, the network goes down, and you're, you're re reliant on a public um, telemetry source, you know, you're going to be liable for them. So we like to set, make sure that the telemetry we use um, is independent and private of any public source. Um, that could be satellite, RF. Um, there are a lot of private or... Um, you know, architectures that you can use that will withstand uh, mission critical use. Um, cell phones can be used, you know, they do make private networks and so forth that, you know, sometimes you can get on. Um, but typically, you know, we like to be on, you know, like a satellite or um, RF backbone. 
Uh, for a lot of systems, we deploy the latency from the time that you read that stage sensor to the time that you can view that data in Contrail is 20 seconds, right? We want to we want to have something that is mission critical. If something's happening, you know about it immediately. Latency is huge. You can't wait an hour. You can't wait 30 minutes. You want it within seconds. Um, whatever telemetry is used needs to be global, right? We want to be able to, you know, depending where you're at, be able to get that data. So if it's a satellite solution, it's global. If it's RF, you have your local RF backbone there. Um, and then redundancy, um, you know, if you're at maybe a hydro dam or a more a larger dam, you may have IP service or fiber uh, ran directly to the dam house. Well, just understanding what is the, the uptime, what is the resiliency of that network connection. Um, a lot of time we will use, you know, that private fiber line or if you have internet service there, it's specifically for sending a lot of data, right? Maybe you have a whole bunch of vibrant wires or output weirs that or water quality and you want to send all this data a lot and we can be on that IP or cell modem line where you know data costs are low. Um, however, if that network connectivity will go to down, having that backup, you know, that redundancy to automatically switch over to your mission critical network. So I want to run through a quick kind of scenario, kind of bringing this all together. Um, for this instance, we are looking at one dam site with a downstream and it also has a camera for verification. This is kind of your most simplistic design, you know, a dam and a downstream. Uh, this one has a camera, uh, you know, for visual visual confirmation. Um, looking at this graph, right, we can see that there was a little bit of rainfall um, recorded at the dam site. Um, again, you know, if you can see the scale on the right, this isn't a much rainfall. But assume that, you know, maybe in the upper watershed where we didn't have gauges, there was an intense rainfall, and all that water kind of ran down into our dam. Looking at this stage graph, right, we can see that based on this rainfall, our reservoir elevation rose approximately three feet, right? Well, what does three feet mean, right? We, we get all this nice data, but making it make sense is what's critical. Adding, you know, these thresholds on here, we can see this bottom blue line. This bottom blue line represents the spillway. So even before this rain event, right, this dam was already spilling with about almost a foot of water going over the spillway. So, right, we could already be in a kind of a critical situation or, you know, we're, the reservoir is already operating in a high state. Well, with this additional rainfall, we see this green line that with that rise that we hit the actual EAP level one where, you know, we understand that something has to happen, right? We need to take action based on the current reservoir elevation. We keep talking about float switches, and I kind of want to show you the beauty of float switches. So adding in this additional data point here, we see this, these orange dots, right? And these orange dots went from zero to one, right? Um, you see them spike up um, right at the same time that the stage sensor hits that EAP level one. So what that tells me is that these float switches were installed at the appropriate elevation, right? At, EAP level one, emergency action plan level, and that they triggered exactly as they should have when the reservoir elevation hit that critical point. So not only do we see our stage graph um, show that, hey, we've hit that elevation 2,730, but we get that redundancy, that check, that um, simple point that, hey, these float switches actually went underwater too and triggered at that same elevation. So what does all this mean for your downstream? Um, Right, we have all this stuff happening at the dam. We saw that the dam elevation rose. Um, we hit an EAP level. We started spilling about three feet over the spillway. Right, this looks at the downstream. So the scales are kind of deceiving here. On the left side of the graph, and the black line is our reservoir elevation, and the right side of the graph is the stage elevation of the downstream site. So we knew that the dam based on the previous data that the dam was a foot over spillway. And we can see that prior to that, you know, the downstream site was roughly three feet of water was flowing through it. But once we started spilling, right, we had a, over three feet of water, we can see the spike in the downstream site. And we spoke to almost 11 feet, right? That's a significant rise uh, in stage elevation in your downstream location in a very brief, you know, amount of time. You know, understanding your dam in your downstream, you know, you'd see this effect too. Maybe the dam isn't spilling, but you open a gate. 
So in that instance, right, we would hopefully see that the dam reservoir elevation stays relatively flat or starts decreasing, but you'd see your downstream have that significant increase in water elevation because you're letting water out. Same thing to go, right? If you have, you know, depending on what your architecture is of your dam, if, um, if they're skirted or anything of that nature and the skirt were to break, right, we would see the, the downstream flow or your weirs um, or seepage boxes increase, you know, for tearing the lining or something of that nature. Um, bringing this all together to imagery, right? This is has a camera at that site. Uh, the picture on the right is what uh, these cameras kind of look like. Uh, but we get that visual confirmation. This is the spillway. We see water going over the spillway, right? Our graph said we had a foot of water going forward. We look at the image. You know, this is great. We get visual confirmation that water is flowing over. These camera sites, are they're, they're PTZ, pan, tilt, and zoom cameras. Um, they can be completely independent, right, with uh, on solar panel. Um, but just to give you kind of a couple ideas of the capabilities of it, this is all one camera uh, that we're looking at. And with the PTZ function, we can zoom into the inlet, inlet structure. Is it clogged? You know, is there anything I should be cautious of? We can zoom to the emergency spillway. We see the earth and spillway in the bottom left corner. Right? Is there water over it? Um, is it damaged? Um, are the kids playing on it? Gates, did someone leave the gate open to access to the dam? You can zoom in and see your EWS, right? Um, you know, if your early warning system goes down, the camera's independent of it. You know, you can look for vandalism, failures, confirm that your sensors are operational, um, anything of that nature. The camera adds, you know, this confirmation and with the technology of the PTZ cameras, you know, it's pretty remarkable what you can see and nowadays with power management, you know, we can power them off a single solar panel uh, and be independent of any other power source. Uh, just as a friendly reminder as I go through this, if people do have questions, you know, please type them in and ask them. And we'll, in a moment here, we'll ask, a, we'll do a little mid-stop to see if anyone has questions. Um, I always like to end on this camera image, or at least end my part on the gauging on this camera image. So we can see this camera. Um, Obviously, this reservoir is dry. We can see the spillway there. But if you take a look at the outlet structure, um, you see a staff. Right? Chuck is circling it for me. Thank you. Um, you see a staff going up and down on that. And that's actually, there's a staff gauge on that. So I just kind of want to show you the perspective of where the camera is and what it can see. Um, and then as we go to the next side, the capability. This is 2 o'clock in the morning, complete darkness. Right? We are with the infrared illumination right? and the technology available out there. At 2 in the morning, you can take control of the camera, illuminate the staff gauge, and if there were water in this, you'd be able to see exactly where the water is, see if your outlet structure was maybe clogged, um, you know, and get that visual confirmation that supports, you know, the data that we're getting from your early warning system at your dam and downstream. So based on that, um, Charles, is there any questions that have popped up or anything that I can answer at this time? We do. So uh, we have uh, the first question on who has established these classifications for the different hazards. Uh, there's actually no one agency that has a single classification. It uh, may, mainly become, comes down to who has authority over uh, classifying dams, whether it's state or federal land, on uh, who has set that. So each state and federal agency typically has their own classification system. Uh, but these classification levels are generally agreed upon uh, by everybody, and uh, most agencies follow something similar to that. So great question. There's uh, just a reminder, each, each state might have slightly different verbiage or classification system with maybe one or two additional levels. Scott, we have uh, two uh, technical field questions. Uh, the first one is, how are junctions kept waterproof? And then how are float switches tested during long periods of uh, inactivity or, or, uh, or dry weather? Sure, very good question. Um, so the way that we uh, do our wiring, well, I'll talk it to and float switches for junctions, is I talked about the end of line resistor. Um, we, everything is soldered with uh, adhesive heat shrink. Um, so it's a watertight adhesive heat shrink that does not allow water uh, to penetrate that joint, and it's actually a solder connection. Um, but with these end-of-line resistors, even if there were to be water intrusion, uh, we take care of that uh, based on our algorithm that is running the data loggers. 
So, right, water can be conductive. Um, so if you have two wires that are supposed to be normally open and you get water intrusion and that closes that circuit, we account for that because that end of line resistor is located just below the float switch. So even if, you know, you had a failed solder joint or a failed adhesive heat shrink, um, this, this system is still going to operate as expected. And more importantly, I talked about kind of that heartbeat or that health sensor. We get notified if that were to happen. So we, we build smarts into these systems. We understand that it's mission critical. So we want to make sure that we're covered um, if things like that were to happen. Um, how do you make sure they're operational? You know, it's a preventative maintenance schedule. You know, these floats, you can easily, you know, when they're dry, you can easily walk up to them, put a screwdriver there, and raise them. So we recommend that, um, that a preventative maintenance schedule is in place where you want to test and make sure the functionality of all your sensors, uh, calibrate the pressure transducers if needed, um, but, you know, lift your float switches and confirm, you know, that that data goes out and that you're seeing that that switch is working correctly. Um, if there's no other questions at this time, um, I'm going to hand it over to Tom Ogden, um, and he will continue on. If there's any questions at the end, I'll, I'll be online to happy answer or anything else. Thanks, Scott. Um, uh, as, as Scott said, this is Tom Ogden. I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, levee erosion and a, a pilot project that we're uh, just implementing right now in the Sacramento uh, River. And, and like dams, uh, levees are uh, inherently risky and uh, prone to some of the same issues that, that uh, dams would be, uh, potential faulty uh, design or construction, uh, age, um, and deterioration, the average age of levees in the U.S. is uh, 50 years. And uh, a little bit different, and you see them in these pictures here, uh, but uh, uh, vegetation is also a significant uh, risk. Um, one, of the, one of the things I, I was kind of surprised when we started uh, moving into this area, there are estimated to be about 100,000 miles of of uh, levees in the U.S. There are 30,000 miles documented in the National Levy Database with 97% of these uh, earthen dams. And uh, two-thirds of the U.S. population are in counties that have at least one levy. Uh, of the 30,000 documented um, uh, levies in the National Levy Database, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers has authority over 13,000 700 miles of those and they've recently been over the last five or six years been uh, conducting inspections of their entire uh, system they've gotten about half of them uh, inspected to date and have reported that uh, 20 percent are at moderate to higher risk so just on the 13,700 miles of, of um, core levies that is uh, 2,740 miles of, of uh, levees that are at risk. And um, I'm suspecting that probably the core levees are, uh, are better constructed. I'm just theorizing, but then uh, some of the state and local levees that are out there. So uh, moving on to this, the, the next slide, we're going to just kind of show you the, just a an illustration of the problem, you know, typically you're down uh, below the levee uh, uh, level. You can get bank erosion. We were seeing that in the previous um, photo. When when you start eroding into the uh, le slope of the levee itself and, and to the toe of the levee, you get into a critical situation. And then as you get flood level, um, you can get further erosion and uh, breach and possibly lose the entire levy. Um, so at, at High Sierra and One Rain, our expertise, is, as uh, Scott was describing, um, is real-time monitoring. So we, we do uh, sensors and telemetry and, and looked at, okay, how can we apply that to this uh, situation where uh, clearly there's some major issues out there. Um, so what we have developed and we're we're just now implementing uh, our first uh, pilot project here in the Sacramento uh, area, about uh, 30 miles north of Sacramento. And uh, on the right-hand side, what we were referring to these as, as beacons. And 
our, our system is a remote erosion monitoring system and the beacons are embedded in the levee and are, are normally asleep and if erosion does occur that uh, washes the bank away these beacons will start uh, floating it'll flip over and immediately start transmitting on the left hand side here we see a pole with a cabinet on it in there we've got a receiver we're using uh, LoRa WAN technology, that's an IoT, kind of a lower cost approach, but very effective for, especially if you have a lot of sensors in a concentrated area, which is which is kind of the approach here. You can't um, have a, uh, you know, one beacon every mile or so. In problem areas, you want a fairly dense um, uh, collection of um, of beacons so that if, if something does occur you're you're picking it up and then the uh, the gateways are strategically placed to pick up those signals and uh, during installation we would uh, record precise location and depth and that gets loaded into the database that's monitoring the system and if the gateway picks up a signal then we would immediately transmit that into uh, Contrail and uh, alarms would be sent out to uh, key personnel, so text and email alarms. There's, uh, we also have uh, heartbeats that would be uh, verifying that the gateway is operational uh, all the time. So um, um, here's just, this is uh, again this, this segment. And interesting to note, I talked a few years ago, I talked to somebody at the California Department of Water Resources and they've got an inventory list of erosion problem sites uh, on the length of the Sacramento River and they're every summer they're addressing some of them but uh, every year they get more, um, they get more locations added to the list so it's like a never-ending list and and so we see this as a, as a solution, a, a real-time uh, solution that will help address uh, some of these risks. And uh, um, I think we've got one more slide here. This is just, uh, we're, we're uh, telemetry and uh, sensor experts. Uh, we're not uh, civil engineers. So we would be working, in this case, the, the uh, local uh, levy district we're working with as uh, a consulting engineer and they're determining the uh, installation pattern and um, how these would be installed on the bank uh, moving back progressively from the uh, from the toe of the levy and uh, each each uh, borehole is going to have a uh, two beacons uh, one about six five to six feet and the other uh, two to three feet of covering over it and um, so that's essentially what we're what we're doing we're we're excited about this um, this pilot project and um, uh, with that I'm going to turn it back over to Charles and he's going to talk about some of the alarming and uh, some of the other uh, functions at the software end of things. Great thank you Tom. So Tom's exactly right I'm going to I'm going to uh, take us out here with uh, what do we do with this data once it's collected, right? And and ultimately, what we're uh, the the entire point of these early warning and real time monitoring systems is to help in the decision making process, right? So we want to make the best decision as quickly as possible with the available information that we have. And really, all of this and uh, Scott referenced this several times, but it, it really kind of starts and ends with emergency action plans, which. Uh, by themselves are outside of the scope of this presentation. Uh, but, but kind of the general flow of these types of action plans is we have event detection. Uh, we're going to confirm the, the condition or the severity level um, of, of the event and what's going on. We're going to need to notify and communicate that information out and then perform some sort of action and assign responsibilities. And then at the end, we will um, you know, terminate the action plan um, and, and have some level of follow-up to evaluate it. So you can kind of see through all of these uh, levels and steps, uh, these early warning systems uh, is relied upon to make those decisions, right? From detecting the event, when is it starting, 
Um, is it raining upstream? Are we going to have some sort of issue? Is my water level drastically dropping at my dam? Um, providing contextual information and historical data to understand the severity of uh, maybe the event we're currently in. And then to relay that information out to notify people and to assign uh, responsibility and uh, actions with everything. So it, it, it starts with uh, emergency action plans, and these are all generated and unique for each individual dam that were um, that is out there. And um, and so really, this is where the software comes in. So this is kind of the end of the. Uh, chain, if you will, right? We have sensors out in the field, and we're sending that data out. The software is the the end of that route, where we're going to be collecting all that information that is being um, sensed out in the field, and that can vary from individual sensors and gauge data information to cameras to uh, all that supplemental data that that Scott was mentioning. Uh, the software then helps aid in that emergency action plan in those steps that I just showed. Um, and can provide that contextual information as well as uh, temporal information for determining the severity and the timeliness. And ultimately, all of this uh, is is used for uh, providing lead time um, and and sending out that that communication um, and delivery of of information. So now I'm just going to walk through some uh, some best practices that we've. Uh, um, have have uh, have come across over the the many years of doing this. Some of this will seem very basic, uh, but it's very easy to skip over or to forget about some of these best practices. So, just want to document them uh, for the recording and and for people to reference as as uh, these systems come online. So, the first thing is we we want a redundant mission critical uh, software implementation. So, the software needs to be able to handle multiple deployment types, right? Uh, we just spent a lot of time talking about redundancy and mission critical on the hardware side, um, but there is nothing more frustrating than uh, not being able to view your hardware data um, uh, because the, the website's down or, or uh, we, we can't get to the Internet, so we're unable to look at our data. So uh, we're not going to get into specifics on how to design that, but it, that is something to think about that um, it is uh, important to make sure that we design the software to match um, the level of redundancy and resiliency that we see on the hardware side as well, as well too. We're going to be able, we are going to need to be able to hit it uh, from the web. Um, if there's an event or an issue in the middle of the night, there's nothing more frustrating than trying to log on to a VPN or uh, try to directly connect to a particular computer. Uh, we want to be able to get to that information as quickly as, po as possible. Scott was talking about seconds for getting data out. Um, we also need to be able to, to get to the software and visualize that data um, within seconds and minutes. Consistency is probably the, uh, the largest uh, best practice that we see that is skirted or uh, is inconsistent. Um, we want to have um, consistency across uh, dam locations, if you're monitoring multiple dams, uh, as well as across uh, different stations, maybe within a early warning system at a particular dam, right? So we want to match up, um, you know, individual data points. We want to make sure we're right on on the the right units and datums and um, and all of our verbiage of dam names and locations are are correct. All of our thresholds, right? Scott was mentioning EAP level ones. Um, do all of our EAP level ones match in color, match in name, match in alarm criteria? Um, we want to uh, have consistent linking throughout the software um, and in our alerting, which we'll get to in just a second, um, and, and making sure that everything is as consistent. So if you do get an alert in the middle of the night and you're trying to verify and it's a different um, datum or, or a, a feat to a spillway, you can quickly understand that without having to, to remember what it is. Um, periodically logging in uh, might sound very simple, but there's uh, oftentimes a lot of these dams, there's no issues for long periods of time. You forget your password, you forget the website. Uh, consistently log in, be familiar with the software, know where to go if, if there is an alert. Have some dry runs of, okay, 
we are hitting level two now all of a sudden what do we do how how do we navigate the software to, to get to that information and we like to have dashboards so you can quickly get all of the information all the data points that Scott was mentioning uh, produces a lot of data so we want to have dashboards that can quickly get to that that information summary pages are a great way have all the links on one page right so if you do get that alarm you can go to that page at the great starting or launching point if you have groups of uh, stations uh, up and down stream group them together be able to have just that information these events can be very localized and only happen on uh, one watershed we don't need to be inundating us with all of the stations within our inventory common native common na naming and datum as I was mentioning before is important and uh, another big thing is if you have particular graphs and overlays that you want to show right multiple sensors on one graph do that work ahead of time right try to try to understand what information and data you would be looking at during an event and save that off bookmark it so that way when you are waking up at 5 a.m. to look at something you're just clicking one button and not having to uh, create special graphs for that access to historical data is really critical to be able to um, to uh, understand severity alarming we want to have consistent messaging between alarms we don't want to be missing information or have uh, information not included links to EAPs uh, or these emergency action plans if you have PDFs of them or uh, anything like that distribution groups People leave, people come and go, have distribution groups so uh, people are not left off. Uh, run periodic reports to evaluate who is and isn't included on uh, alarm deliveries. Um, and then finally, have alarm escalations uh, that if, um, if, if someone doesn't respond or is not made a, aware of it, it goes to a larger and larger group until someone is made aware. And include surrounding agencies on, theirs, on their alarms so they can also be aware. Reservoir operations, this is not uh, certainly for all of the dams, but if you're doing any sort of control or have some sort of um, a spillway, we have all of the data being collected out in the field. We know our inflow and outflow or discharge. Uh, we know what the current conditions are. We can help to understand, hey, how do I operate my reservoir more efficiently or, or how many hours until I hit my spillway at this current inflow rate. Um, so this is a natural next step for uh, some of these systems for, uh, for uh, understanding what's going on. So in summary, uh, but before we get to that, just uh, go ahead and, and send in your questions. We, we'll get to them very, very shortly here. Um, but in summary, I'm just going to keep this up while we, we answer some of these questions. Um, and and we'll, we'll go ahead and get to these very quickly. So we have some, some pricing and, and cost questions. Uh, unfortunately, I uh, cannot respond to those. Uh, the, the reason for that is every dam is unique, right? Uh, the, the, the length of the PT or pressure transducer run uh, greatly varies the price, or um, you know how many how many uh, float switches we might have. Um, you know, what are we putting in a water quality sensor? This can can greatly vary the price. Um, so, uh, but we'll be happy to follow up and feel free to, to reach out to us and we can provide uh, some, some more specific information based on uh, what you're requesting, including with the, uh, with the erosion sensor. Uh, we have a question about the REMS, the erosion monitoring system uh, that, that Tom mentioned, uh, just confirming that these are buried. That's correct. So these, those, uh, that little toggle you saw on the right is buried in the earthen levee and that uh, when those break free, when there is erosion, that's what triggers triggers the data point and the alert. I'm going to put up our contact information here. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any follow-up questions or you would like to get information about anything you saw today. Uh, we'd be more than happy to provide that information. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, stay safe out there, and uh, thank you for, for attending and all of your great questions.